All right, everybody, Nate Eaton here with Nancy Grace at CrimeCon in That's Austin, Texas. That's what you Texas. say. <laughs> Nancy, how many years have you been to CrimeCon? Since the beginning. Since the inception, the beginning. What is it that fascinates people? Why is true crime so fascinating to people? Well, Nate, I think the fascination... I, why do you always call it true crime? Okay, crime. Is it fake crime? Crime. Yeah, I guess true crime is the catchphrase. We're recording, David. <laughs> um, true crime. I think since the inception of humanity, when the first murder went down in the Garden of Eden, remember Cain and Abel? Mm -hmm. We still talk about that. I think that people have always been fascinated with crime because, uh, let's just take, who would be a good, let's just take Scott Peterson, okay? Some people, not me, but some people think Scott Peterson is handsome. He's got a college degree. He's a smooth operator, very charming, a sportsman. I uh, remember I think he went to school partially on a scholarship, golf. Just great family, has it all. It's hard to imagine him with his beautiful wife and this lovely home there on Covina Avenue that he would kill his wife and child in such a horrible manner and actually throw her body in the cold, muddy waters of San Francisco Bay. I'm just thinking about those choppy waters and throwing her over the side of his boat. But it happened. And it's hard to look at him. I remember he'd walk into the courtroom every day like a varsity football player. Yeah. Chest, boat out, all that. It's hard to look at someone that has everything going for them and realize your mental picture does not jive with the hard physical evidence. It's just the mind is tricking the eye. And I think that that captivates a lot of people. Well, uh, that reminds me of Chris Watts. Ugh! He is not handsome. Why does everybody say he's handsome? Ugh! I, duh. I, I, mm -mm. If my husband were to tell me he was going to the gym every day, I'd say, N-O, you get back to work. Go make some money for Pete's sake. Uh, but, no, Chris Watts, actually I see what you're saying. He seemed like the perfect dad and husband, so devoted to his family. It was hard for people to believe, and I think his parents still don't believe it, that he had a double life. And if they are confronted with the hard evidence, they will shift blame on Shanann Watts, the dead wife. It's really amazing to me. I think people very often see what they want to see and uh, they have blinders on when it comes to things they don't want to know. You were a prosecutor how many years? Well, I was a Fed for three years uh, and then I prosecuted violent crime for 10 years. I was with the Antitrust and Consumer Protection Bureaus of the Federal Trade Commission before I became a felony prosecutor. Wow, so you've got the experience. How did you get your break into television? Was it OJ? It was a total fluke. What happened? Complete fluke. Well, let's see, how did this whole thing happen? Okay, um, <laughs> there was a guy that had been convicted many years before I ever went to law school. His case went all the way up to, I think, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and came down and landed in the DA's office when I got there and I was supposed to work a deal. So the guy had already done like 25 years or something. So it came up on a, a court calendar one day and I, the judge called the calendar and in walked what we call a silk stocking lawyer. Criminal defense attorneys and prosecutors, we don't make any money and your clothes show it. Mm -hmm. In comes a guy wearing, it had to be a $3,000 tailored suit with, I mean, his socks were more expensive than my, my dress I was wearing. And he came from King and Spalding, which at the time was the preeminent silk stocking law firm. And he had been assigned to handle this pro bono case, <laughs> this guy. <laughs> so he didn't know a criminal case from mm. a hole in the ground, but it, it was an it, it was a case that had to be worked out because sure. he had already served his time. Yeah, he invited me to his Christmas party at his home with his wife and family. Turns out his wife worked at CNN wow. as a booker. 
Wow. Somebody at the party worked at, at, at some booker. And she said, hey, I've read about your cases. Would you ever come on CNN? I'm like, well, actually, I'm busy all day. It'd be hard for me to break away. A few times, I would run up the hill and comment on a case and run back down the hill to court. Hmm. Anyway, I got an invitation in the mail one day at work inviting me to be on a panel of experts. And I'm like, I can't possibly go to New York because I have a rape trial on Monday. I can't possibly be gone that weekend. The trial got further notice, so I went and fortuitously sat between Johnny Cochran and Roy Black, no straight off the Kennedy debacle and O.J. Simpson. We got in a big fight and they offered me a show that night. What? And I said, no, because that's not at all what I, I wanted to fight crime. Yeah. Anyway, shortly after that, my elected DA, who was like a grandfather to me, retired. I called Court TV right back and said, hey, you know that job? I'll take it. <laughs> and I moved to New York with two boxes of clothes, a curl and iron, and $300. Oh my Lord. What could go wrong? Wow. <laughs> but then you moved back to Atlanta. Yeah, I stayed in New York for, oh gosh, I guess about 14 years-ish. The twins were born, I raised them, and one day, we were at the playground, the playground in New York. I think it was on first and about 60. The playground was basically an asphalt basketball court yes. that had been painted green. Sure, yeah. And there was a swing, and the line was 10 deep to get on the swing. And once you got on the swing, you could only have 10 pushes. And I turned to my husband, I said, well, we're going home. <laughs> that was that. We moved on. Wow. And kept the show. Yes. And I just based that out of Atlanta, although most of my staff was still in, in New, New York. York. Yeah. And now you're doing the podcast. It is a program. A program podcast. And it's not just a podcast. A po it is a video program podcast. It is a program of breaking crime and justice news devoted to solving unsolved homicides and missing people and crime of the day. We devote a lot of time to forensics, uh, medical examiners, death investigators, reporters that are experts on certain cases. It is on CrimeOnline.com. It's called Crime Stories. It is now on Sirius XM 111. And I'm proud to say we are now picked up by Fox Nation, which is subscription. Do you have Fox Nation? I, because I have a voucher for a year free. I'll take if it. You need it. I'll take it. Um, and this is all you do. All you do, now, now get this, you go to Google and you put in Fox Nation log on and it takes you right there. It's awesome. And you're on that with hundreds of other programs. Yeah. Do you ever miss the courtroom? A lot. I miss it a lot. You know what I liked about it? At the end of a, a case, I would know I had done a good thing. I would have investigated the case myself on top of, for instance, Atlanta Homicide, who did a fine job. But I would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had the right guy. And I would feel good that for that day, for that moment, for that year, that guy was off the streets. Because it's the only thing I need to do after my fiance's murder. I didn't really know what to do, but I knew I couldn't teach school anymore. Hmm. And when I was growing up, my favorite book was To Kill a Mockingbird. Hmm. And I loved, loved, loved Atticus Finch. And that's really where I got the idea to go to law school. Wow. Last question, what happens with the Daybell case? Tammy Daybell, Tammy Daybell did not die in vain. I really believe that Tammy Daybell's death was, let me just say, the final straw. I believe cult mom Lori Vallow is a serial killer. I think she will be prosecuted and convicted. And her husband, Chad Daybell, her henchman, will also be convicted of murder. However, one caveat, if we 
don't stay on it ourselves. Cases have a way of fading away out of everyone's memory. For instance, when you think of Vanessa Gilliam, you know Aaron Robinson escaped and killed himself, but what about Cecily Aguilar, his co-defendant? She's never been tried. Hmm. The people that harassed Vanessa Gilliam have never been publicly named. The guy that ran Fort Hood at the time still gets his big fat paycheck. He's in the officer's club right now having a big fat steak. Hmm. Nothing happened because people forgot about it. I'm not going to forget about J.J. and Tylee. They will be vindicated. Nancy Grace, thanks so much. <laughs>